And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one, two, three, four, four good brothers in the temple. The four... The four the the four man crew the four man crew that is the that is the crux of Diamond Recreational Studios. Better best known as Ikirio, Vox, Cybomb, and the returning Horus. And currently de currently developing a expansion for Lancer known as Field Guide Liminal Space. How y'all doing tonight? Or today, doing. in one person, in one person's case, because damn time zones. We're doing good, and it's good to be here. Thank you. For Been waiting me. all day. So, yeah, some of you, some of you sounded like you were waiting on bated breath, and at least one of you had to lie to me and say that, and say that you'll be good. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't make you those promises. Don't make promises if you know if you if you know you can't keep them. Hey, I love that franchise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you probably don't. You probably don't like jackal snipers. Yeah, probably Hell, not. No. God, I've got to get back through that horror. It could be. It yeah. could be worse. You could do a lasso run. It. It has been worse. I'm not rated to play those games on Legendary. We've been doing co-op with it with a buddy of mine, and we learned the hard way that in two, if one of you dies, you both go. Well, yep, Iron Skull's always Ooh. on in co-op. Do you know? Do you guys know what a lasso run is? I do not. I do not. Legendary, all skulls on. Ugh. It's hell. <laughs> and it's not hell because of the difficulty. It's hell because you have no goddamn HUD. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, uh, considering my skills with that, uh, you don't want me playing next to you on that. Uh, of course, I'm not one to talk because I'm as I'm I'm a complete masochist given that given the amount of Kaizo games that I have in my library. <laughs> Two fair. people that you are talking, well, three people you've talked you're talking to have written for uh, Paizo. Uh, Fox and I have actually been working together for. Want to say nine years now, and the Jake? majority of them. that that was Kaizo, not Paizo. Wrong oh. demon. <laughs> okay, still demons. Kaizo Mario, aka, were your skills at platforming go to die? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I fail at that game too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not a platform gamer at all. Yeah, fair, fair enough. That um. It everybody's got everybody's got their own cups of tea, but um, so th one of the traditions, as as Horace is aware, is the humble beginnings. So I'd like to delve in. I'd like to delve into that. And of, of course, Horace, I'm I'm skipping you for the time being because we already went through this with um the sphere with the spheres of guile episode. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, but for Vox, Sai, and Iki. I'd like you. I'd like you to walk me through your origin story when it comes to um, role playing games. Sure. Um, I'll let the other two go first because they've got a longer history than me, and mine sort of ties into theirs near the end. Oh man. Okay. So, how far back you want me to go into the magical land of complete context? As far as it takes. Uh, be very so, careful asking oh, that buckle one. Buckle up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, Freezing probably. both barrels out. Moving on. <laughs> so, when I was seven, I started noticing that Dad would vanish like two Sundays a month, and I started pestering him about it. And he goes, "You're not going to have any fun. It's not. A, it's not something you're going to have any fun with." I finally get him to take me. And we go down to our apartment complex's rent and office, and he's there with some of his friends from school and from college. And they're doing this thing with maps and these little metal dudes, and he's talking about these skeleton wizards and shit. And about halfway through the session, he hands me the sheet for the Healbot cleric he's been running as a DMPC, and I became Brother Broman, 
who died immediately. <laughs> Extremely immediately. That was AD&D 2E, which I would play for, God, seven years, mostly in Ravenloft. Dad's group eventually drifted apart. I moved to 3.5 with some friends from middle school and high school. Started doing my own homebrew just before I realized that the uh, the luminaries I looked up to were, in fact, human people who were actually kind of bad at their job. Which was not a good realization to have at that time in my life. Ended up cutting my teeth a lot in the Giant the Playground forums for a long time. And started working for Dreamscard Press when I got headhunted there for a friend of mine that was doing their Path of War stuff. I like Path of War. It, it was a troubled development in many ways. And I'm going to skip past that completely. But... Thank you. Dreamscard was going to be my primary publisher for quite a few years, essentially up until real life kind of killed us all at the same time. Mm -hmm. When Lancer came out, I took an interest in Lancer. At that point, I'd been reading and devouring role-playing games voraciously. I'd been into various editions of World of Darkness. I'd tried out some Palladium games, which don't. <laughs> I learned that <laughs> Palladium has been my whipping boy for 20 years. I don't know what happens to every layout person they feed to Kevin C. and Bita, but we need a saint to cut them out of his belly. Well, there's a reason why I, th why I thought the big why I thought the biggest jo the biggest joke um in regard in regards to in regard in regards to Palladium was when was when they lo was when they lost um, Robotech and that got ha that got handed off to a couple to a couple other studios who, in my opinion, did better work because they weren't using the Palladium system. Yeah, yeah. So I Lancer caught my eye early in its development. I mm -hmm. couldn't back the Kickstarter for it because I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. But I got the free rules when they came out, and most of the time when I encounter a new system, my first instinct is to try to make something for it. So that I can understand it better. Mm -hmm. Marley, Oz, and Silver was my project for that. And it has been in development these last two years or so. Jake grabbed me for a formalized project after it was starting to shape up. We'd worked together before at a lot of stuff on Psionics content for Pathfinder, on Path of War, mm -hmm. on Steel Forge for items. You know, we knew each other. We'd worked with each other really well. And it's been nice getting back in the saddle. And I think I'm going to take that as a handoff, unless you've got something else uh, there, Vox. Go for it, my dude. All right. So this is Cybomb's origin story. You might have heard him call me Jake. That is, uh, is uh, my real life name. Uh, but anyway, uh, Cybomb here. And uh, apparently the whole Our Fathers Teaching Us D&D 2E is a common theme, because that's what happened to me, too. I saw this weird book uh, that had a lot of really cool creatures in it. That turned out to be the Monster Manual. Mm. I read through that uh, because I've always been a reader. And around the time D&D 3.0 came out, uh, my dad got me, the, got me the box set, and I played with a bunch of my friends in high school. And I quickly realized that I wanted to tell stories that were not yet written. So I meandered onto Wizards of the Coast uh, forums, and they had a homebrew forum, and uh, the one that taught me how I write the character optimization board. I, uh, uh, yes, the bir the birthplace for me of 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 many uh, many an amusing thing like um, Godzilla and Pun Pun. Uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> it yes. So over there is where I learned how to do my statistics, how to, I, or how to apply my statistics. I've been, I've been DMing since approximately six months after D&D 3.0 came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I basically never stopped. Similarly, I never stopped writing content since then. So one day on a forum, uh, 
uh, someone else at Dreamscar Press was doing a project, and I saw this project, and I threw... Uh, I want to say it ended up being 45 pages of math and reviews at him, mm. at which point Vox said to his bosses at Dreamscard Press, hey, let's recruit this guy, and they picked me up, and I started writing, officially. Uh, so, turnabout is fair play, I guess. Uh, so, that's where I got my start for actual, uh, actual paid writing, and it has been a trip seeing behind particular curtain when lancer started up i i heard some good things so i came to it and being a math and statistics guy i immediately got into the math and statistics of it and i was impressed i've never seen a system hold up like this so i started writing as well mm -hmm. so uh downfall group that's my bunch here and i got my idea of this you know, bunch of spies and saboteurs that wanted to take down the big mega corporations. I asked over in uh, PilotNet, the Lancer server, they have a lore channel, and I asked there, uh, you know, where would this group go? I was trying to write their background. And Tom answered. Tom is one of the five voices of Massive Press. He's like the original writer, mm -hmm. or one of the two. And he told me where they'd go. And so that's where they went. And that's where they've stayed, again, for about two years now. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Vox uh, writing his stuff, and I saw Ikirio uh, writing his. So I decided to do my best impersonation of Nick Fury and ask them to join the Avengers Initiative. And <laughs> as you can see, as you can see, they both said yes. No offense, but I don't think you're black enough for that. Oh, gum. I've got the same skin tone as Casper, so... <laughs> uh, also, I don't I don't see you rocking a pirate patch. Uh, I've done it once in my life. I do not recommend it. What what happened? Did you get too, did you get too close on the scope on the scope at a shooting range? That tends to be how it happens. <laughs> uh this is going to be the nerdiest thing I have ever said online, but it was a microscope. Oof. You know what? You're not the first person to tell me that. So at least you're in good company. You're the first person to respond to that sentence with that particular reply, so I'm actually rather surprised. As cheesy as as cheesy as it sounds, um Um, I've I seem to have I seem to have developed a shtick of man I've seen some shit. <laughs> haven't we all yes speaking of haven't we all let's go ahead and hand it off to Icky mm -hmm. sure thing so my father's relationship with Dungeons and Dragons was non-existent I am breaking the pattern here how dare you <laughs> instead what actually originally got me into role playing games was not a role playing game as such Growing up, I owned the Eye of the Beholder video game, the one based on AD&D. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And I played through that relentlessly. And mostly got my ass kicked because it's AD&D with no GM being nice to you. Also, our, also um, RN Jesus hates you all. He does. <laughs> this is true. Many people are saying this. But from the... No, oh, my apologies. I was gonna. I was gonna say. I just have to bring up XCOM, and already people get Vietnam flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, from there I moved into actual role playing games when I went to high school and met some friends that were into it. I found this out because I had a copy of the Dungeons and Dragons Third Ed book. I also had a copy of the pretty terrible software that came with it that allowed you to make a character. A, f a person who would later become a good friend of mine turned up to an English class where you needed to invent a character for an assignment with a printed off character sheet from that creator. <laughs> oh my god. And me being this, you know, dumbass little autistic kid basically stood up and went, Jacques, he's using a character creator. And that is how I met one of my best friends in high school. 
No, that's that's not that's nicer than my that's nicer than my high school stunt. Mine what mine mine was um and this is something I've done I did in college several times. Um submitting a twelve page report in mirror writing. Ugh. Because the due date was April first. Of course. <laughs> you know, that's on the teacher well at that played. point. <laughs> well played, but holy crap. Oh. So, um, unlike these, I, I did actually end up on the D&D 3.5 forums, mm -hmm. which I do not recommend for anyone, and I'm glad they're dead. It's like staking a vampire. Because that those forums sort of made me aware of how much a lot of design communities for players by players can often be just rather cruel to new people who don't know the rules and are still trying to figure it out. So I, I got my start there. I had not a particularly good start because I was a dumbass teenager who didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I got <laughs> some nasty feedback and didn't really design again for a while after that. But later on, I ended up really getting into homebrewing because of all things... Um, talking to a psychologist who recommended writing as a way to sort of de-stress. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I got into doing Relentless Homebrewing. I like creating things. I like the solidness of rules. And writing is something that helps me calm down. I got very into Lancer the moment it came out. And... Um, Entertaining enough, I'm actually the reason the Lancer Discord has a homebrew channel. Because I would sit there, I would make a thing, go, hey, I made a thing, and everyone would go, oh, god damn it, Icky's making things again. Can we just <laughs> make a little timeout box for him to sit in? Well, that's li well the making a timeout box isn't going to fix things. It's just, it's just going to put a temporary bandage on it. Because you're gonna get out. Because yep. the thing about time is, it runs out. Yep, and that is why there is now a homebrew design channel because it was Icky is Icky is just taking up space in rules discussion. <laughs> let, let, let's let's make him a moderator, and we'll also shove him in a homebrew design box. Well, there there was a man who trolled the NHL into. Make into making a better making a better set of rules. So sometimes this happens. From there, um, I'd actually met Sai a little bit before I first encountered Lancer, mm -hmm. where he was working on of all things Starfinder, mm -hmm. and um, I'd been doing a little bit of Starfinder tinkering myself, and because of my because my tinkering had run into some weird rules aspects where I I do not recommend trying to calculate damage per round when you have things like roll twice and take the highest as part of the math. Mm -hmm. I'd had a friend help me and we'd put together a just an auto-filling sheet for calculating damage per round and I went, wait, I can use this for other things and I just sort of hurled it at Sai's head without warning. And yeah. apparently he remi he remembered me after that. <laughs> I don't Literally. tend to forget who, <laughs> I don't tend to forget people who, you know, manage to pull me up on statistics, okay? It's not very often that it happens. I'm not as good at math as you are, but I can definitely do data entry without any issues. <laughs> And that was that 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 spreadsheet was an awful lot of hours of just I'm gonna enter data and you know calculate what is the weapon most likely used at this level, what are the stats that would be used at this level, yada yada yada. And that apparently got me size attention because part way through me working on not actually Magnum Opus, a different company of mine, because I I'm a relentless home brewer. Um, Sai so went, hey, do you want to be part of an actual project? And I went. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Magnum Opus is sort of my baby, and it's a combination of a couple of things for me. It's me finding just blink state. I, I, I'm an infrastructure person. I like working out 
how things get places and how the systems work. So for me, the Lancer settings blink gates just really fascinated me. And that's why Magnum Opus have such a hefty focus on blink gates. They are blink gate designers. But at the same time, I'm also a relentless mythology nutter, and in particular, Arthurian mythology and Celtic, mytho Celtic mythology. Yeah, bad words. Anyway, um, I'm a huge fan of mythology, and especially the pre-Christian history with mythology. And that is why Magnum Opus ended up with such a big theme with its naming and its people of sorcery, alchemy, and just occultism in general. Because it allowed me to play in another area I also like playing in. I can see And that. I believe... Go ahead. I was just going to say, and I believe that's uh, introductions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Yeah. With that kind of thing in mind, I, I was going to ask how each of you got it got introduced to Lancer, but that's our, that that was already tackled with this. What <laughs> I what I will ask what I'll ask instead is I'd like you guys to walk me through the chain of events that led to you deciding to do that deciding to do this particular um pro, this particular project with Field Guide Liminal. Uh, so after I asked uh, both. Uh, Vox and Ikurio, uh, if they wanted to be a part of a real project, uh, of a project here, uh, we all just started writing, and we got our stuff together, and I want to say for the entire first year, we didn't actually have a name for the collected project. Uh, Vox, is the re Vox is the one who spotted the common thread and put it together. So if you want to take it uh, from there, go for it. I mean, and all English has left my mind, like my father left my life. Uh, <laughs> no one's ever ready for it. Anyway, so when it came to getting it together for Liminal Space as a collective thing, I do... I, I end up thinking about the flavor of stuff a lot when I'm moving through, and the common thread between them was all that they were stuck somewhere, stuck on something. And it didn't... All those elements were present to begin with, but they were emphasized to differing degrees. When I met Downfall Group from Jake there, they were just super spy jokes. Or super spy deadly serious, depending on the thing. But I was like, you know... They're trying to tear down the master's house with the master's tools. They can't do that. That's not going to work. And from there, developing out DFG was very much about, like, what are they doing about this? This can't be sustained forever. They'll get caught, they'll get found, or they'll need to grow to the point where exposure is inevitable. And that put them in that between place right now. They don't have to make the decision immediately, but they can't duck it. Magnum Opus started out getting drawn into the Onic War, which we've walked away from a little bit since we're still waiting on edits for the On in Base Lancer. But there was that idea that they'd been trundling along, working their working their grift, just doing whatever Union tells them, because as long as the money keeps coming, why do you have to make good decision one way or the other? And then they got kicked in the ass, and now they've got to make a decision very quickly that they've been putting off for ages and ages under the mistaken impression that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And Marley, Oz, and Silver's trying not to become the things that they're fighting, or at least not to become the problem they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And they need power to keep solving that problem, but in reaching for power and reaching for influence, you are in turn influenced, and they're steeply aware of this cost. So getting everything together has been... There, there's been a lot of stuff in the group DM that's just us discussing themes or ideas that starts off with some shit post and then just moves naturally from there. Which 
that tends that tends to be how these things kind of work. I mean, um, the f my favorite example that I that I always come up with is how Muscle Wizard went from a joke into a serious build discussion. <laughs> I mentioned I was there on the character optimization boards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that one happen. Mm -hmm. That was utterly hilarious to me. <laughs> um, and nah, and. It was it it only t it was only a matter of time before it started infecting other communities. Um, I have seen people do muscle wizard builds in Dark Souls, <laughs> but would it be fair to me that uh, that in the early days of Liminal Space before before it would become a field guide proper, that a lot of it was a was a collection of ideas that that everybody was bouncing around. Yeah, we oh, were happy. doing a lot of work with each other, even at the start. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, absolutely. All all three of us had our own ideas. I mean, I, I was making a bunch of super spies with frames uh, themed on the Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, that's not normally a space that shares design space with other things. Mm -hmm. But it was just... We just bounced it around, and it just kept being fun. And I saw you talking over there, Icky. <laughs> Come on. Go. <laughs> um, I was going to say, we honestly do owe a lot to each other for all we've done. Like, Vox got me thinking a lot more about where um, Magnum Opus end up falling with not just the fact they need to make decisions, but the fact that they're active decision not to make decisions in the past is itself a factor of their personality. Mm -hmm. And then when I was starting off with Marley Odds and Silver, I didn't know where to go with that. And Icky publishing the homebrew guy that is still up in Lancer's server today helped me get the ball rolling at all. Mm -hmm. And... Let's also face it, uh, no matter how many jokes you might tell about your own guys, uh, hearing what other people think of what you're writing is always going to help you shape what you write. It, because you can tell a story all you want, but a story is meaningless without people reading it. So really, uh, hearing what Icky Rio and what Vox thought of my super spies and the ensuing ridiculously hilarious jokes seriously i cannot remember two-thirds of them <laughs> um but that really gets you that really gets you rolling that really gives you a direction mm -hmm. um like there's certain jokes that came from even our artists uh Mochevsky. let me go ahead and plug him because he is absolutely amazing Domachevsky, when he was doing uh, one of my art pieces gluttony uh, he puts a lot of little details into places. He puts, you know, he gives the pilot's personality, and in this case, the gluttony is a size 2 frame. It is four times the size of a human. It is this giant, multi-legged, multi-armed horror with a huge, freaking jaw across its belly, and it devours its foes, carrying a, an enormous antimatter cannon, and... What does he do? But he puts a warning sign on the side of this cannon, and we just cannot stop laughing about this thing. It actually caused me to rewrite uh, bits and pieces of that weapon just to account for it. Mm -hmm. Um, the same goes with little bits of personality. Uh, that we joke about. Uh, we joke about some of Vox's frames where the LEDs on the sword are more expensive than the rest of the frame because hey, that's that was the joke about his com about his uh, entire company is that his guys are cheap and they're trying to make these things that'll last forever for you know half a mana, mm -hmm. um, and that fed into some of his themes and the three hundred years of combined customer service and nerd rage jokes. Uh, for from Magnum Opus fed into some of his, uh, mm. and it just helps push forward. Nomo's art for the Rasputin also really influenced a lot of uh, Marley Oz and Silver's gallows humor kind of vibe. Like, 
to give you an idea, I'll post the thing up in here. Mm -hmm. Someone has to paint a variant on this on three different layers of this egg by hand every time they field this egg. <laughs> and they do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so just that image alone has made the Rasputin uh, frame easily the most playtest thing among any of our frames just because everyone sees that and says, I want to play that. <laughs> I want to play the egg. Yes. Um, so uh, between that and just playing that playing the song, I'm not going to start singing, so be proud of me. <laughs> playing the song. Uh, and there's the size 3 egg generating windstorms and, you know, the ammo out of enemies' uh, weapons everywhere. <laughs> it's amazing. Some of the stuff didn't end up getting installed until we did formalize it, though. Like, uh, we, we, God, we were all on seven frames apiece until we decided to make this a thing. And then in early discussions, we were like, well, Long Rim's gonna give everyone one more mech. We should have one more for all of ours, right? And then Long Rim didn't do that because they made it asymmetrical. We've played ourselves. <laughs> yeah, uh, and let me tell you, getting an eighth frame into Downfall Group when the first seven were seven deadly sins, uh, yeah, that took some research. While in my case getting the eighth frame involved Vox teaching me that sometimes you need to take your design and just take it out the back with a shotgun. I feel so Red. bad for Merlin, version 1, and version 2, and version 3, all of which got the shotgun treatment. I don't. Rest in pieces, wizard. Oof. Yeah, Merlin's a shithead. <laughs> yeah, you'll... Yeah, go... Um... Much like much like much like certain get much like certain pissed much like certain really bad um, high points. Don't bother don't don't bother mourning for it. You'll just find another one. It actually ended up becoming a joke with the last designed of the frames for it, where it's like, oh no, we need a spellcaster to replace the Merlin because the Merlin just is not working. Wait, Nimue is the person who sealed Merlin away in a tree or a cave, depending on the story. Fuck it, we're using her. <laughs> so we ended up with a frame whose name was picked purely out of the fact she killed the crap out of Merlin. <laughs> yeah. Now, with, the, with, that, with that kind of thing in mind, you, with the, within, the, within the field guide... Um, you talk you talk about three new three new mech manufacturers with eight with eight frames each. Now, a thing I find a thing I've always found interesting when it comes to Lan when it comes to the mech manufacturers of Lancer is that there's always there's always a certain theme that one can assume from each manufacturer. Some of them are some of them are going to lean into the more the more bulky and gu and gun toting end. Um, and then there's going to be the weirder end of the spectrum. So with the three manufacturers that are going to be in this book, what's their what's their particular motif that they're going to be falling on? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take this one alphabetical, which means downfall groups up first. Mm -hmm. uh, downfall group, it, they their frames are called the sinners. Uh, they are really, really big on accepting drawbacks that other people would not be willing to in order to pursue their goal. Mm. Like, uh, the examples I love to use are the sloth frame, which itself is permanently slowed. It cannot get rid of this condition. But in accepting this, it drives forward. It's completely unstoppable. And if you find yourself within reach of that hammer, it, you're in for a very bad, but very abbreviated day. Mm -hmm. uh, everything in Downfall Group follows this. All of them have some flaw or vulnerability that they just cut off of themselves to drive everything else forward. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Magnum Opus. Magnum Opus are the blue control. Of Lancer. <laughs> Magnum Opus doesn't want you to have fun. Magnum Opus doesn't 
want you to make decisions. Magnum Opus wants to go, I am here to control this battlefield, sometimes by hacking, sometimes by literally rewriting the battlefield itself to be one better suited for me. But in general, Magnum Opus are tricky bastards who do not want to engage in a head-to-head fight. They instead want to make you very sad until they finish you off. Mm-hmm. Now, Marlias and Silver's mechs are, uh, they're greatly inspired by, by the tales of zombie mechs from Battletech, which I also grew up with. And in Battletech, it was this idea of, like, you have all of these really old, very maintained suits that they they were built up armored to hell and back because you can't replace a mech if it blows up. Mm-hmm. And then when people finally could, and they built all these sleek, highly tuned fuck machines that go around the battlefield really fast with really high power weapons, they deal damage to an enemy that they're like, that's enough damage to kill it, we'll move on. And this thing would lurch up and shoot them in the back because it's it's still running, it's still working. These old up armored clunkers, they didn't go away. And these new generations of pilots who'd never had to deal with this in the battle before could only see it as the dead come back to slay the living. Mm-hmm. Marley Oz and Silver's big on surviving, not at any cost, but they take a licking, they keep on taking. They don't do tons of damage. You don't see them field heavy weapons. And in exchange, they get a lot of combos with their with their main and smaller weapons. They have a lot of emphasis on single combat where they want to drag you down to their level and beat you because they're better at being trash than you are. Tar pits. Tar pits. They give you an eye, like... Most of their mechs have a survivability trait of some variety, some more pronounced than others. Mm -hmm. The Frankenstein gets more armored as she loses structure, so the more you kill her, the harder she is to kill. If you would take out one of the holiday structures, he gets to shoot first, and if he hits you, your attack doesn't happen. The Celeste can just straight up put one of her structures back on once a mission, because, you know, fuck you. And that's, that's kind of the thing with them. They're built for the endurance match. If Lancer's a game of attrition, they're not here to end it quickly, but they'll have more resources at the end of most missions than many start the mission with to begin with. Mm-hmm. Now, with, now, within that... The other thing, I, the other thing I'd, be, I'd be kind of curious about is... How is how the is how the how those how those fit and um went in comparison to the ba- to the base set of manufacturers to make sure that there's no overlap since that's always an issue that can come about whenever you're expanding you know making sure nothing steps on someone else's toes yeah indeed and like I've got an obvious one because core does have guys that are focused on hull that's IPSN. And IPSN gets a lot of defensive traits, a lot of stuff that boosts their hit points, their armor, their reach. So, in some ways, uh, Marley Oz and Silver is kind of hull through a different lens. Mm -hmm. They get some little things that boost their direct survivability, but where IPSN gets, say, to increase the size of their mechs, Marley Oz and Silver gets to ignore status conditions by taking damage. Mm Mm-hmm. Where IPSN has increased armor, Marley Oz and Silver rolls in with being able to shoot if they get structured. They're always they're they're a more mobile, more resource focused take on hull, where IPSN's a very funky hull. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, go ahead. Yep, yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, the when you brought up when you brought up the Frankenstein and the and the tar pit approach, uh, as well as well as as well as it having a, a bit more of a horror vibe, um, I end up, I end up thinking uh, I end up thinking of the the company that has the wholesale monopoly in co- among the big four of weird ass of weird ass design and weird and weird ass systems, that being um, Horus. Indeed. Um. And. 
given how given how given how um Horace's max can be could be horror stories into them unto themselves of a different kind um how do you how do you make sure that 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 particular angle is ma is made distinct so some of it is just that like here let me let me show you Frankie I don't know if you've seen Frankie but we have Frankie <laughs> here oh, Frankie's amazing Horace's max are these near are these strange monstrosities they're not shaped right they're not built right frankie is a pile of trash which is steam cooled mm -hmm. and like there are horrific elements you've got you know the donner that everyone has a bad time with after they read the donner mm -hmm. and donner's thing is he eats max to repair himself and to repair his allies and he can eat corpses out of the combat missions to take power to cost actions. But where Horace's horror is very existential, very based on the idea of uh, an almost cosmic horror vibe where your perceptions of reality are not correct and what you don't know is coming for you, Donner and Frankie and even like the Snake, they're a very grounded horror. They're your monster movies rather than your Lovecraft. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one of the things I mentioned on Downfall Group as well is that they very explicitly steal everything that they can from everyone. So I want to say two or three of my frames explicitly call out that, uh, yeah, we found some horse. Uh, horse made the mistake of giving some licenses to one of our guys, and uh, we decided to roll with that. So the picture I'm putting up right now is actually the Lust Frame, uh, which just completely encapsulates the wearer. They do not have a direct perception of the outside. Uh, they're entirely dependent on their frame to see the world around them, and as a result, they can't see outside of sensors. Mm -hmm. Which, while not terrible, uh, it's definitely not great. So their point of view... Uh, is just one of dependence. Mm -hmm. Now, now with the, now with that in mind, um, I'd like to. I, I think it's obviously since we're dealing with new max, we're obviously going to be dealing with new co with new core bonuses and pro and probably new kit. Um, obviously we can't go through all of the core bonuses because then we'd be here all night. But I'd like you guys to give me a um, sampling of some of some of the core bonuses that are going to be exclusive to the, to these new co to these new companies. Okay, if you, you want can... the coolest one, go ahead and ask Ikurio. He's got some of the most extravagant things I've ever seen on his. <laughs> Look, it, it's only because we have money and lots of weird paracausal bullshit. <laughs> But um, okay, I'll start. I suppose Magnum Opus, their blink bait, their blink get builders, and this gives them an absolute domination when it comes to the area of getting shit to places, mm -hmm. because that's what blink gates are for. And the core of this is that their core bonuses, multiple of them, play into that fact by giving you access to resources that other people would simply not. The, the biggest of those is the exogenesis contract mm -hmm. where you have signed up with Magnum Opus to go, hey, I would like to buy terrain, please. And at the start of every encounter, you get to pick two fancy pieces of terrain and you go, no, these are here now. Mm -hmm. So, for example, oh, you're about to have a fight in an underground facility. Yeah, Magnum Opus can just portal in a river of magma to block off that corridor you don't like. Mm -hmm. Or you're in the middle of a hellscape. Yeah, they can send a terraformer drone to just remove all of that dangerous terrain you don't like. Mm -hmm. It's one of the weirdest core bonuses we designed. And I'm really happy about it, just for getting across the feel of, no, these guys have all of the money and all of the ability to get things places. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, it also really sells the, we have all the money and none of the sense. They are scientists and engineers. They wanted to do what they could do, and they freaking did it. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't one of the mechs have a mail-order cannon? Um, yes, actually. It turns up in a piece of fluff. Yes. Okay, so the Magnum Opus Ptolemy is their big fancy um, sniper mech. Mm -hmm. It is a scary robo spider, and its big trick is that its super heavy weapon is not actually on the battlefield. Your super heavy weapon is you now have the targeting system for a weapon. And whenever you press the, tr whenever you pull the trigger, Magnum Opus will fire that gun through a fucking portal at someone. Mm -hmm. Oh man! It, it, yeah. So when you're talking about starship scale heavy weapons, blasting someone, uh, it, it, yeah. yeah. Now Jake, you want to hit us? A no, sorry. I was gonna try and prompt Jake for the DFG core bonuses. Okay, so uh, downfall, downfall are core bonuses are really really tricky. They want to modify you, and they want to modify how you approach mm -hmm. fight. Uh, so my personal favorite one that I wrote was miniaturization. Mm -hmm. It's hey, your opponent is expecting a titan. Let's give him a human sized opponent instead. Miniaturization makes you occupy the space of something one size smaller. So you get these mechs that are normally running around trying to crash through walls like the Kool-Aid Man all of a sudden walking down your corridors. Mm -hmm. And they have not lost any effectiveness. Um, on the flip side, I also have additional device rails. Where uh, normally you can only put one a mod on a given weapon. Uh, not anymore, you can put two now. And this means that your weapons can do some really, really oddball things because those things, uh, working together, can just radically change what you're doing with that weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides that, I do a lot of scouting things. Uh, I have to thank Ikurio for uh, for helping me write the uh, extremely low frequency detection arrays. Uh, yes, elf ears. Uh, that lets you scan as a free action once around because I want to know everything, mm -hmm. and you are not going to stop me from knowing everything. Yeah. And then for Marley Oz and Silvers, a lot of them are just little things, but the two standouts for me are your Malice Override. You, you know, pay them for the package. You acquire the core bonus. And if your mech would get immobilized, jammed, stunned, you can instead overload its systems, take damage and heat, and not be jammed, immobilized, or stunned. And, you know, it goes with their thing of, like, we gotta keep moving, we gotta keep fighting, we're not... We don't have time for this. But the dramatic one, and the one that's probably seen the most editing, is the, uh, the slasher sustainability suite. Once a scene, if you would take your structure, you can choose to take it as stress instead. Once a scene, if you would take a stress from something other than this, you can take it as structure instead. Mm -hmm. Let's you pick which health bar you lose. And in the process, heal back up to full so that you don't take that overflow damage. Mm -hmm. And it's this big, dramatic thing where they've got these repair systems installed under the surface of your mech, and when you have them kick in, they'll take the slag from your melted armor and use it to rebuild your parts, and you know, shunt the heat into your mech's metal so that bits blow off instead of your reactor going. It's it's a garbage heap, but it'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have I mentioned that boxes are? Uh, internally proclaimed fluff master. Uh, when he writes something, the imagery is always freaking amazing. Uh, it's not a title I claim for myself. Mm -hmm. Yes, which is why we had to give it to you. <laughs> now, 
with that in, with that with that in mind, the other the other thing that go, the other thing that I was a bit curious when it comes to DFG is you already mentioned that it is that it's that it's mechs are rooted in the seven deadly sins, um, and you've already you've already shown sloth, you've already shown um, lust. I'm curious what the sand what the sandbox is like for pride. Right. Okay, let me go ahead and throw this one up. This is actually the first one I got art for. Mm -hmm. um, this is another piece by Domachevsky, and Pride... Uh, so, the lore behind the Pride was that they made this one completely above board. Uh, they, uh, Their parent corporation is IPS Northstar. Uh, and IPS Northstar said, we need something for PR. We need something that'll look good and record us doing cool things. So uh, Downfall Group made what they call the MacArthur frame, and it is big, it is shiny, well, not big, but it is shiny, it looks cool, and it is there to just record everything. So that ended up with a limited run, so a Downfall Group says, you know what? Now we need something to distract people in the event that we have, you know, covert operations that are not being as covert as they need to be. So what the Pride does is it literally just overwhelms you with uh, laser light. It doesn't deal much damage. That's not what it does, but it will. It looks like the middle of a disco scene when while it's doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the Pride, and well, it draws all eyes while your buddies either run away or beat up the targets. Mm -hmm. When you meant when you mentioned IPSN want, wanting some wanting something for wanting something to look good, um for whatever reason I ended up thinking of the Battlemaster from well BattleTech. You're not far wrong, but I I was coming at it more from like with a camera. And literally, he has a drone that is nothing but a camera. <laughs> it's like, yes, let's record things. Oh, and by the way, I'm looking around corners now. Mm -hmm. That camera drone took a couple of revisions, but I'm actually really proud about the end result. It is a nasty bastard. Oh, yes. Oh. And I, and I, I can certainly see that needing some revisions, because an easy trap that you could that one could fall into... Is have is having a micro character is having a micro character sheet. Oh God! Um, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's so, a problem that happens a lot with companion char um, character builds. Yeah. So I mentioned that uh, Vox and I have been writing for most of a decade together. We have seen where the pitfalls lie. Uh, so both of us knew to absolutely avoid that at all costs. And then Magnum Opus Interstellar has not one but two different drone frames, and they're two of the coolest ones in this. <laughs> <laughs> so we, that's what you get. Though, to be fair, the way Lancer handles drones, they're not so much independent characters as they are area effects you can shoot. Yeah. Drones Which and Lancer feel... is so much easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. It really keeps the headache down when it's less, this is a person who does things on their turn, and more, this is a blast area, but if you shoot the center of the blast hard enough, it goes away. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you look at um, the magnum opus Solomon, who goes, fuck that rule, I'm making it back into a character. <laughs> that oh, man. Yeah. I've all. I remember someone describing um someone describing game des someone describing um game design, especially when it comes to character archetypes, as creating a set of rules and then finding ways to break them. Rules are there to make you think before you break them. Mm -hmm. At least briefly. Yeah. <laughs> some, <laughs> I think in some cases it's not brief enough. <laughs> but. Yeah. One of the, one of the um one of the big one of the big um po points of interest when it comes to le when it comes to the when it comes to field guide liminal spaces is Agatha Station. Um, 
Uh, Agatha. Agatha. My Um, my apologies. (laughs) Yeah, New New Agatha Station is something... Weirdly enough, New Agatha Station was entirely just a minor background detail to start. But when it was revealed that Tom and Miguel are going to be heavily revising the Orn stuff, my original, hey, do you want to play in a place was very heavily tied into the current into the Ornic War. But with us not really knowing where the Ornic War would go, oh, I had to ent- I had to entirely just redesign things and create a new place for the people who wanted to do stuff with Magnum Opus stuff to play with. And I went, what about I play with their home base? Because players like having cool bases and as a blink station, it can be literally next to anywhere you want your campaign to be. Mm-hmm. Blink stations are shockingly huge. This thing's got a population equivalent to what? Canada, you said? Canada, Canada. which admittedly makes it... I think it's about 20% population-wise above a standard blink station. Mm -hmm. But that's still... Most blink stations are nearly a Canada. Yeah. And... With that that kind of thing in mind... Um... I'm I'm guessing that... I'm guessing that within within the description of... Of it, there's pl- there's plenty of sto- there's plenty of story seeds that a GM could use to build a campaign around. Very much so. Even outside of um, the actual flashpoint I've written, um, Fairyman's Toll, mm-hmm. the New Agatha Station, I tried to make sure that every single location mentioned in it has at least one you could base a, you could base a mission off this. And given that people who are backing the Kickstarter are able to call uh, the shop, there's a support tier where you can actually put a location or group uh, into there. And yes, he's putting them in. And yes, uh, he's making sure each and every one of them could get one of these location, one of these locations or scenes. Mm-hmm. I don't know how he does it. And I'm the one, and the one who this is his first big one project uh to to be frank i i have it a bit easy because new agatha station is an entire canada in size there's a lot of place to put things when you have an entire canada to work with mm-hmm. us canada yeah when, i think when which i think is important to note because when i think when a lot of people think of um stations no matter no matter what no matter what their purpose in science fiction they're usually thinking of of overly cramped places, you know. Yeah, while well, no, is cr- everything's scrunched. Whereas this kind of station, would it be fair of me to say that it wouldn't be too far removed from the space colonies that are se- that are seen throughout Universal Century Gundam? Very much so. I do not recommend landing this thing in Australia. <laughs> well, we we already know we I already we already know what happens when colony drop is cons- is considered. But yes, um, these things are much more on the Universal Century end. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, with New Gas Station, I have an entire section that is just on weird locations that are not necessarily a place somewhere lives, but a thing you could see. Mm-hmm. And one of them is Celestial Seas, because a big station has massive glass panels mm-hmm. to allow people to see out and allow light to come in. Mm-hmm. New Agatha Station changes them up a little bit, by making that also the water storage for the station. Mm-hmm. So you will be going around this massive circular station and there will be all of a sudden a sea with the stars beneath it. Mm-hmm. Because that is the water storage of the station. And let's be frank, Magnum Opus really like making things look fancy. Uh, if, it, if it was in evidence with the, with the name which translates to great work. Yeah, no, th- th- they are entirely up their own ass. <laughs> no wizards have no rights. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. But in fact, now that, now that I think about it, some I'm pretty sure somebody's going to end up homebrewing a set a set of mechs that are based entirely around the alchemical process. I should probably so stop like one. You should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> I is is this so... the bit? Is this the bit where I talk about the Zhao Yan? 
Uh, you yeah. might as well. Oh, well. I think it is. Start with Zalyon. Um, I'll get the art for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, while he's fetching art, uh, one of the stretch goals is uh, alt frames. Uh, six more potential things that could enter this. Actually, nine if it goes far enough. Ah, there's the Zalyon now. Uh, but one of the alt frames I was writing is uh, called the Flamel. I'll give you one guess what my <laughs> inspiration from that is. I don't need I don't need that one guess. I I've already got that down pat. And the Zalyan looks exactly as I thought it would. Yeah, the Zalyan is a terraforming mech. Its entire purpose is it's one of the Magnum Opus mechs that was not actually originally designed to be a combat frame, though it does that job quite well. What this thing is designed to do is to help new colonies get started. It's big enough to punch a big megafauna in the face, mm -hmm. but its primary thing is that it's really good at using its drones and nuclear transmutation to just reshape the battlefield around it. And so, you know, you need a, you need a city built? Okay, it can flatten the land. You need to have some underground stuff done. It can tunnel those for you. It's a world shaper, and people have realized, oh, right, that's good in a fight, too. Yeah, especially, especially since it's a good way to say fuck you and your cover. Yeah, it's also got the single longest damn core power in the entire book. Because I needed to actually write out what various environmental conditions do. Because while Lancer does have environmental conditions, that most of them are not really balanced around a player throwing them at people. No, they're yeah. built. They're built for a GM throwing them at people. Yep. Yeah. So instead, you now have options like, oh yeah, you can just create a tornado with the core power. Mm -hmm. Or the weirdest one is Chrysophia, the process of turning a, a base metal into gold where it just wipes out everything in the area, and anyone who falls prone in the now pool of molten gold takes burn. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you guys shooting for as far as the total page count for this thing? Because it sounds like you got a lot, you're, you're going to be packing it in. Big! Uh, at the moment, balloon, my man. the master doc I threw together, which currently has no art, no page trimming. We don't have like the credits page or anything. It's sitting at 194 pages by itself. And that's before we've had any stretch goals. Yeah. Uh, if I did some napkin math for if we hit all stretch goals, uh, with all art, with all text, with all the extras, with everything, it we're talking about easily 350 pages once all is said and done. Although, admittedly, that's if we hit the stretch goal to add the fourth manufacturer. Oh. But even but even without that, we are looking at something that, while not as big as the core rulebook, is surprisingly comparable. Yeah, it's fucking getting there. It's very interesting, given the fact that we're so early on in Lancer's like third-party life cycle, I'm interested to see how this affects third-party publishers for Lancer going forward. That was actually part of the intent for the project. I like this system. I like it a lot. And I have seen what good, bad, and ugly third-party publishing looks like. So part of the intent was to set the bar. Mm -hmm. I want people to look at this and say, yeah, that is what I want to do. Before they sit down to write something. Dan Humble on the Liminal Space Team. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. Uh, I am many things, but Humble is most certainly not one of them. And I mean, we had earlier me talking about how me bothering people accidentally created the homebrew channel in the first place. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, y'all signed on with Diamond Recreational Studios. Our logo is literally a pile of money with a big diamond on it. We're not exactly the most humble studio out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but counterpoint, Marley Oz and Silver's logo is the broken coin. Oh my god, this guy. Yes, one of my logos from, for, one of my sh for one of my podcasts is a bunch of controllers arranged, oh. to, arranged to look like a cross 
I'm not the um the last one in this room to talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I'll mention that Marlios and Silver does in fact have the Phoenix, so let's go ahead and get that out of the way. <laughs> um, God. Uh, considering the, the yeah, considering the seven deadly sins includes wrath, and that wrath frame is somehow not the angriest one in our book. Um. Yeah, Phoenix actually fell prey to the same thing that hit uh, Zhao with the uh, the environmental effects. Her big cannon used to cause dangerous terrain that dealt burn, and then it turned out the math on that does not work on this or any other reality. <laughs> that cannon had to be revised like six times. Like, it, it works fine for it's on a map, but when players start making it, not quite so much. It is the big one on her back here. Phoenix yeah. is where you get sentenced to for your pilot crimes. You go in the warm box. Yeah, it, you might have you might have noticed by now, and anyone watching this might have noticed by now. Uh, the phrase we have revi we have rewritten this five or six times. We have revised this a dozen times. We have completely dragged this idea out back and shot it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all of these have been going for two years. Okay, every possible thing that you think of that can go wrong, we have probably seen it, including up to this last week, all three of us were making emergency edits left and right as someone uh, dropped feedback onto us. The amount of revisions we have gone through on every sentence of this book just boggles even my mind. Though the counterpoint to that is, I am so goddamn grateful for the Lancer community for giving us all of that feedback with which we cry. Oh, no joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, being a writer and expecting to not revise things is like being a boxer and expecting not to get punched. <laughs> which, not... Well, maybe, maybe you could get a, maybe some a boxer not wanting to get punched. Maybe they could maybe they could cosplay as Glass Joe from Punch Out. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> or you know, you could just go become Hulk Hogan. Touche. Oh man! Why why must you bring back these memories, Icky? What did I do to you aside from everything? Mostly the everything. Damn! I knew everything would haunt. Yeah, you're. Yeah. Go ahead. But with all with all that said, what what would you guys say that you're shooting for as far as a release window? Are you guys thinking um, Q one Q one twenty twenty three? What you have to understand right now is that anything that is not specifically coming from backers is already written. It is done. It is being laid out now. Uh. I, when we say it's ready to release, it pretty much is. Uh, Horace will have the time frame for you a lot better, but if it's, if it takes until May, I will be shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're aiming, so the biggest thing that we're worried about delaying time right now is going to be our art commissions, mm -hmm. just because we did hit that stretch hole, we need to commission some more art. Um, and art lead time varies from artist to artist. Some people can get stuff done in a week. Sometimes people take a little bit longer. Um, but if we get things squared away with the art pretty quickly, we're looking at a March release. Um, now, and, oh, for the oh, PDF, okay. for the PDF, I should clarify. Um, yes. The print release is looking at coming a lot later because... First off, we have to get our proofs and everything from Drive Through RPG, who we're doing print on demand with. Uh, so that's going to take a while, given the international shipping delay issues right now that are affecting every industry. Uh, and then on top of the shipping issues, there's also the printing issues that are specifically affecting the printing industry, uh, also caused by the global supply shortages and all that mm -hmm. fun stuff. So I currently have our expected delivery date for the print stuff in September. Uh, and that, I, I'm confident we could hit September, but the, you know, if the situation worsens with the global, with the international trade, and that's out of our hands, mm -hmm. and I can't predict one way or the other on that. But uh, 
we should be able to have that PDF out, I think, by the end of March. Um, mm -hmm. Barring some crazy, horrible accident or something. And one of the advantages we have there is that one of the artists we're working with, um, Moitera, Moitera is a goddamn machine when it comes to putting out quality art very quickly. Like it, oh, yeah. once that once they start working, they can have a full fancy piece of art done in like three days flat. Yeah, we have like legitimately like set pieces. At, uh, that uh that uh commissioned uh like i'm i'm tossing one up right now of oh well, i i started tossing one up too jesus yeah. christ let's see if we grab yeah. the same one mm -hmm. okay. nope, nope. <laughs> uh, those two uh were each done inside of three days a piece um so oh damn then Domachevsky uh, Pride was done in a day or less. Uh, Gluttony was done in less than two. Uh, our 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 stable of art talent are a bunch of remarkable folks. So we can get ahead. Of, we can get ahead of some of it. Like when we get emails back from the folks who bought for the back cover splashes, we can get that taken care of ahead of time. Just manage our time. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how, to seeing how this de how this develops. But with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And uh, trust me, we enjoyed it. And thank you for taking a look at the madness behind our internal chat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we really appreciate been... coming on here. Mm -hmm. and it's been a pleasure. Anytime you guys see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss Lancer or just to just just to do a glorified shit post, the door is always open. As I often Thank say you very much. Here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>